as a wonderful end to a sort of a wonderful science period. We've just had a, a you know, 10 days or so of great science news between the Premier's prizes and, of course, there were some great recipients in there, but, of course, the, the main prize went to Professor Rick Shine uh, for his work on snakes, most important, and cane toads, very important. Um, and then, of course, a few days later, Rick won the Prime Minister's Prize for Science. So um, I'll let you into a little secret. You might know that Business Events Sydney has a magazine, Sydney Shine. As a matter of fact, some of you have seen me starring on the front of it. Um, but... Rick said to me the other day, because his brother John, who headed the Garvin Institute, um, won the Prime Minister's Prize for Science about 2010 or 11. So Rick said to me, um, you should have the two of us, John and Rick, on the front of Sydney Shines. So that's what Business Events Sydney will be doing next year. Um, I've, so... Today, uh, our speaker is Rebecca Johnson, who's the director of the Australian uh, Museum Research Institute. And Rebecca has, um, well, she trained, let me start simply, she trained as a ballerina. And luckily, she also trained as a molecular geneticist. These days, probably um, you'd think of her as one of Australia's foremost wildlife forensic scientists. She's a conservation geneticist and she's the co-chief investigator of the Koala Genome Consortium, which is a tremendous project, very important um, for Australia and for Australia's iconic animals, because it not only is about the koala, but we can do similar things through for other animals. As to, she's the, you're in the inaugural director of the Australian Museum Research Institute, aren't you? And as such lead, um, over 100 scientists and, and technical staff at the museum. And um, we're lucky that Kim McKay is here too, the director of the museum, and it's been wonderful to see that institute flourishing and all the things that you and Rebecca are doing, Kim. Rebecca's um, done a lot of work in the, in the wildlife and the iconic animal area for Australia, but the one thing I want to mention before inviting her to speak was the thrill we had at seeing that she was one of the Australian Financial Review and Westpac 100 Women of Influence in the Innovation category a few weeks ago. So it's been wonderful seeing that. And the very last thing I should mention is that she's a tremendous colleague in government, gives us a lot of help in, in my office as we do things. And one of the things we did together recently was look at the Ballina Bypass and how we have to protect the koalas while the Ballina Bypass is done. So we do some very interesting things in in government, and to hear about that and to hear about um, the wildlife detective, please join me in welcoming Rebecca Johnson. Thank you very much, Mary, for that very kind welcome. I too would firstly like to acknowledge that today we're gathered on Gadigal land and I wish to pay my respects to their elders both past and present and also acknowledge any Aboriginal people in the room today. I'd like you to look at these three pictures and <laughs> they range from Johnny Depp with his incredibly well-documented, illegally imported dogs, to an aeroplane turbofan engine, to a cute cuddly koala, one of which we, we can see here today. And I would like to so warmly thank Chad and Jess from Featherdale Wildlife Park for bringing Archer, who is officially Australia's cutest animal, according to Facebook, and, and my niece and nephew are here today, and, and that pretty much is an official source when, you, when you're a young person. So thank you so much for bringing along Archer today. By this, this may seem like a brain teaser, these photos that you can see here up on the screen, but by the end of my talk today, I hope that a common thread between each of these, do, to, these three themes becomes clear as I talk to you about the research that we do at the Australian Museum. So hopefully you did have a coffee and you're ready to answer this brain teaser. 
I'm going to tell you f firstly today a little bit about the history of the science that we do at the Australian Museum and then I'm going to run through some of these different themes and, and they're very much translational themes, um, applying research for, for outcomes that make a difference. And by the end of today, if I've done my job correctly, the, the linkage between them will become clear. Before I do that, I thought that I would pose you a question. We are a state government research institution. We compete with incredibly worthy other uh, requirements for funding, such as roads and hospitals and, and schools. And our funding, like most of science, is, is ever diminishing, and we're expected to do more with less. We, we think that we deliver very good value, but I'd like you to think about the value of science that we, we deliver through, throughout my talk today. And this is a question that someone posed to me in the last couple of weeks in a conversation that I was having. From, and, and this person was not from the science or from the museum sector. And he said, if we didn't have a museum, would we go ahead and create one? Uh, so I think I know the answer to this question, but I would like you to consider it while, uh, while I'm giving my talk today and, and give some thought into whether or not you think we demonstrate how important we are. So you probably know, based on my previous slide, the museum was established in 1827. So that makes us an incredibly old museum. In fact, we're the second oldest scientific institution in the country after the Royal Botanic Gardens, who celebrate their 200th anniversary this year. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can see us here on our current site today. And that's where we were established in the, in the 1850s. That's when our current building was finished construction. A lot has changed around the museum during that time. It was no longer a market garden out the front. But we have an incredibly long and rich history of research and, and collecting and understanding the world around us. And we recently had an Aboriginal elder from the Wiradjuri group with us at the museum. And she, in fact, highlighted that the Gadigal people would have had a very intimate link to that sandstone that that building was built from. And so acknowledging that museums are an incredibly Western construct, they're, they're something that the Europeans that arrived in Australia created less than 40 years after the country was established. And, and, and we, our, perhaps our history with Aboriginal people and Aboriginal uh, collecting is, is not that illustrious, but today we spend a huge amount of time ensuring that the very significant collection that we have and the important research that we do connects with the local people and, and groups from all around Australia to ensure that they understand their, their history through our collections and through the contemporary research that we do. We have a very long history of not only cultural research but also biodiversity research. And um, I, at this point, I would like to put in a plug for our upcoming exhibition, which is on spiders. And you can see some of the entomology collection here, which is not spiders, but the, the, the idea of this slide is to give you an idea of the, the range of collections that we have at the museum. In fact, we have, you can see the entomology, the fish collection, part of the mammal collection here. The, the, the range of collections we have expands over 18 million specimens. And these are things that we have collected since uh, the museum was established, and we continue to do so through our research and our exploration. And, and this is a really important thing for me to highlight that it, it, it's very active. The work that we do at the museum is incredibly active. We, it, right in the middle of this slide, you can see a picture of Alan McCulloch, one of our former fish curators at Lord Howe Island. And we, so we regularly go on expeditions and field trips. You can see um, Siobhan, who is actually here in the audience today. Here, here she is doing field work during her PhD at Macquarie University. So we have a very active contemporary focus on our research. But the importance of me highlighting the field trips is that we're about to go back to Lord Howe Island next year. This photo in the middle was taken in the early 1900s. And we've been there in years since. So we're in a position to gather the data that we've collected over those different trips, understand what it is that was discovered and, and catalogued at those times, what has changed over time, so that we can understand how things are moving, how ecosystems are changing, so that we can maximise the conservation outcomes for those areas. And, and just this year alone, we've been to the Solomon Islands, to Papua New Guinea, to Bougainville, to the Simpson Desert. So, so a very active program of exploration as well as our science. 
something that often surprises people is the, the contemporary and current nature of our science. In the last year alone, we, our scientists and our associates described 199 new species, which is pretty extraordinary, a pretty extraordinary contribution to the knowledge that we, we have of Australian and, and biodiversity from our region, and, and critical to that understanding. And you can see here, these species range from marine sea worms in the top left-hand corner, there's a blind snake next to the sea worms. We, we even had a worm named after the Research Institute, which is pretty exciting. We, we've got a whole range of new frog species. There's a, even a new bird described from the fossil record right in the middle, which is those bones. So the research that we do is incredibly current and makes a genuine contribution to the foundational science that I'm going to tell you about the translation of today. So for me personally, you've heard that I'm, I'm a geneticist. I have the pleasure of being able to work on all of these things. These things pretty much represent current or very recent projects that I've worked on with my students and our collaborators at the museum. So this is a, a, not everything that I work on, but, but a pretty amazing snapshot of the type of things that we do get to, to cover in our work. I think Arch has gone to sleep. I'm going to wind the clock back a couple of years and just give you a story which I think is a great encapsulation of the translation of museum research. And it, it, perhaps something that wasn't an immediate, uh, the museum was not the first place that they came to, or they, they thought of to answer this question, but we, we did a pretty good job of it. And this story is called Snake in a Box. And the story goes that we had a I'll just move away from that microphone. We had a, um, a phone call from the New South Wales Police who asked, they have this expert referral list which we're pretty sure they uh, use for the really weirdest, wackiest questions. And the question that they had for us was around this story. And the story was that they had a, poli a serving police officer who had, had discovered a death adder on his front driveway. He lived at the police station, so it was the smallest police station, and it was, um, he didn't realise it was a death adder until he and the family gathered around thinking that they were looking at a blue tongue lizard, but um, on closer inspection the blue tongue lizard didn't have legs and was quite, was perhaps a bit longer than you expect a blue tongue lizard and uh, was one of the most venomous snakes in the world. So the reason that this was unusual was because I've got uh, the map you can see here. Highlighted in green is the known distribution of death adders. Where this police officer lived and, and had the police station was just kind of south of the green part towards the ACT, in the ACT region. So not a known area for death adders, but not far outside of it. So not completely impossible. In fact, that's the, that is the kind of research that we do. Uh, our scientists are constantly discovering new records and therefore extending ranges of species or contracting ranges if they've moved out of different habitats. That, that's part of understanding biodiversity. But so, so the, it was a very unusual sighting. They called the authorities. The authorities removed the snake to um, appropriate habitat. And then um, they went around the other side of their house and found this box. And this box had his name written on it, a special delivery to constable, blah, blah, blah. And it also had a range of swear words and um, other kind of un, you know, unpleasant messages written on the outside of it. So the, and it was tied up with string. And to the point where they suddenly started thinking, given the unusual occurrence of the death adder and this box, is there a chance that the death adder could have actually been left inside of this box at, for a serving police officer? So it changes writing a threatening message to a police officer to quite a different thing. That it, it is, in fact, a deadly threat if you would leave a deadly snake for anyone, really. So the question that the expert referral team asked us was, if we brought you this box, is there a chance that you could tell us whether or not there had been a death adder inside of this box? So we thought about it, and, and again, going back to the kind of skills and expertise and, and strengths of the museum, we not only have, uh, museums have collections of death adders that we can use as reference material, we have um, significant genetics expertise at the museum, and we have the understanding of science and, and what, what are the, our options when we're trying to make this identification. And, and what this case would be is we would be looking for the presence of transfer DNA from that death adder being in that box and, and potentially leaving, sloughing off skin cells and leaving DNA behind that we would then be able to detect. So, so we thought we'd give it a go and we, we swabbed in all of the places where you might imagine a death adder had contacted the box on the edges where it might have come out on the bottom 
And we did, in fact, find the presence of death out of DNA inside of this box. So th it does turn it into a deadly threat. In this particular case, they did not find the perpetrator. However, the New South Wales police actually use this as a, a very interesting training case study. Firstly, the, the value of forensic science in cases that might not meet, be immediately applicable. And secondly, the value of the incredible scientific expertise that is available in the community to answer these kind of questions. This is certainly not something that I thought I would be doing in, in my day job when I started work at the museum, but it is a great translation of our science. So the use of a snake as a weapon is, would, would be considered wildlife crime, uh, wildlife or environmental crime. And you can see here it's actually massive business. Environmental crime or wildlife crime, it covers anything from the trade in, in listed species to illegal dumping of chemicals or uh, animal remains to illegal mining, illegal fishing, and even the illegal logging industry, which is worth a huge amount of money. And when you put all of those things together, this, the, the quantum of this trade is considered to be a, in the order of up to 200 billion US dollars per year. It's an, a, a complicated crime. Not only is it inc incredibly impactful and causes a lot of damage all round, but it's particularly complicated because this type of crime typically goes across borders. So a wildlife can be transported between countries which have different legislation. Some of them have different ways that they're going to invoke that legislation. Some of them don't have legislation. And, and so in that respect, it is very complicated. But it's something that we have discovered is a really great translation of the knowledge and the collection that we have at the museum. And over on the right hand side here, you can see this is a picture from a seizure a couple of years back that our team was involved in. This, this was a seizure of um, illegal listed species, things that were prohibited from trade. You can see a range of different mammal skulls, there's primates in there, you can see a wolf, the range of different skins. And this is something that this fellow had in his backyard shed. Um, and, but something that the museum was able to assist with through the identification, so penalties could be, but appropriate pen penalties could be applied in this case. And this is typically the kind of work that we, we spend most of our time doing. We've decided to go into it in a reasonably um, professional way and we have accredited laboratories now, so we're accredited to the equivalent level as the human forensic laboratories to do forensic work, but we only concentrate on wildlife. And we typic the kind of cases that would typically come our way are things that are under that are listed, involving listed species, so things that are uh, of high conservation concern and they're protected under the legislation from trade uh, except under certain very specific circumstances. So, and these, this covers um, the recent CITES meeting in Johannesburg a couple of weeks ago added a few extra species to this, but there's about 35,000 species of plants and animals that are restricted under um, listed species legislation. So anything from a tiger to this, this cycad here. Uh, the, the guy on the right -hand cor top right-hand corner, this is how people try and get illegal wildlife into the country. This is a case from, from about 10 years ago that we were involved in. These are a bunch of different parrot eggs that were from a range of, the, from range of levels of endangered species. And down the bottom right hand corner is probably one of something that's uh, rocketing to, to attention is the, the pangolin. And there's eight species of pangolins. This is a mammal, it's a scaled mammal. And these were recently given the highest level of protection at the recent CITES meeting because they're traded in the tons illegally for their meat and for their, their scales are used in traditional medicines. So I thought the best way would be to give you an example of this kind of work via a case study. And this is something that um, we worked on a couple of years ago. Uh, this gentleman, Mr. Steckley, had travelled from the Czech Republic via Abu Dhabi to Sydney. Uh, and on arrival in Sydney, they discovered some irregularities around his groin region where they found that there were, he had eight eggs strapped either side of his groin, so 16 eggs in total. Uh, in this particular case, something that people don't know is that Australia has incredibly strict biosecurity legislation. It doesn't really matter what it is. If there is a biosecurity risk, these would be euthanized because of the, the risk and the illegal importation that they, they represent. So uh, they were very underdeveloped and DNA was very important in identification to understand exactly what it was that he was importing because different penalties will apply depending on what it is. 
So in this particular case, uh, DNA analysis revealed that all 16 eggs were from this species, the monk parakeet, which is a parrot that is native to South America, something that's quite popular in the pet trade, I understand. So firstly, all parrots are listed with the exception of budgerigars and cockatiels. So firstly, we're, we're dealing with an, a listed species, so those kind of penalties automatically apply. Secondly, in this case, monk parakeets in places where they've been introduced are well documented to cause damage to infrastructure, to built infrastructure. So you can see a couple of parrots nesting on this power line here. So some states in Australia actually list these guys as a, a biosecurity risk or as, as an invasive pest. So not only was this person importing something that was listed, they were also importing something that is potentially a pest. So there was kind of dual charges that were laid. He eventually was charged with the, um, the listed species importation. He spent 72 days in jail and was, ex was deported, excellent, deported to the Czech Republic upon his completion of time in jail and the completion of the case. This was a, is a great example of, of our expertise all coming together to provide evidence that then is used in, in the legal system. So next time you're travelling on a plane, uh, firstly you might look very suspiciously sideways at the person sitting next to you and to what they might be carrying on their person. Uh, the, uh, the next thing you might think about is the, uh, the Australian Museum and the role that we have in risk management. And so here is our uh, the second theme that I'd like to talk to you about today, which is the, uh, the understanding of how birds and bats, so basically anything that flies, and, and infrastructure can collide in ways that are, are not intended. So what happens when a bird or a bat collides? <laughs> Typically you have, this happens about four or five times a day in Australia. It doesn't usually result in these kind of significant damages. And, and you may remember um, the Hudson River ditching in 2009, and I, I believe there's a movie out at the moment. That was the re result of a bird strike, a double engine ingestion bird strike. So uh, multiple, um, not very large relatively, but and relatively squishy compared to a plane, individuals went into an engine, and are, uh, the, the, relative, the transfer of relative velocity is actually enough to do this kind of damage and, and cause significant consequences to the industry. So we routinely identify species that have collided with planes at the, at the museum. Again, a great translation. These days, um, industry collaboration is very fashionable, and as it should be, it should be to be, it's, it's to be encouraged. This is something we've been doing for close to 10 years, and a really, again, a great demonstration of, of how we contribute to risk management in industry. When, when something like this happens, even if it's not the kind of damage that I'm showing here, uh, anything resulting in an air turn back or, or an aborted takeoff or something, it immediately costs money in terms of delay. If, if there's damage, it's going to cost a lot of money. And there are documented cases of fatalities due to bird strike. So, so if you're not thinking about the person next to you the next time you fly on a plane, you might think about the role that the Australian Museum plays in risk management. Uh, and just to further reiterate that point, these are, this is damage that's occurred because of bird strike, or, or in our case, bat strike as well. About 25% on average of strikes can be attributed to, to flying foxes and micro bats in Australia. And there's, each airport has a different risk. Remembering that Australia has an incredibly diverse ecosystem and a, a huge range of, of species, each airport actually has different things that they need to pay attention to because they have different residents effectively on their, in their airfields. Um, these are just some of the candidates, but over the, the nearly 10 years we've been doing this, we've, we've actually expanded the list of, of species that have collided with planes to, to many, many, many more than we thought would, would be responsible when we first started this work. So finally, we, we've had a, there is no better demonstration of why we do what we do than seeing a live animal. Um, it also always amazes me that Archer is a wild animal, but he's happy to sit there and sleep on Chad for the, this entire talk. They are incredibly docile creatures. And, and I would like, before I start this final section of, of, and tell you about some of the work we've been doing around the koala conservation and the koala genome, I wanted to again highlight this work is possible through the foundational science that we do at the museum, through understanding what species we have in, in Australia and in our region and understanding how they operate in the ecosystem. We're able then to translate this into things like conservation, like working with Mary's office in, in things like koalas. 
Before I do that, though, I would like to bring your attention to a, a rather embarrassing highlight or rather embarrassing statistic that Australia leads on. And this is one of the very important reasons why conservation is so important. Australia has the worst extinction history, record of extinction uh, in, in the world. In, and in fact, since European colonisation, which is not very long, 54 species have gone extinct. Those are mainly, mostly birds and mammals, but a couple of invertebrates. And at, at the moment, there are over 400 species that are listed as vulnerable, critically endangered, or even extinct in the wild. So. This is something that there is a lot of attention being given at the moment. No one wants to have this record continue on their watch. And so it is really encouraging to see that there's so much work going towards this by the New South Wales government and by the Commonwealth government. And so I'm going to tell you more about the genomics side of conservation. And I thought it would be worth highlighting and reminding you of some of the benefits that have come out of genome sequencing since the first genome, the human genome, was sequenced in 2001. So for the, the scientists in the room, um, it won't be surprised to know that there were two competing groups working on the genome at the same time. And they both came out within a day of each other in 2001. You can see the covers of the paper, papers here. What came out of the human genome? It was a $13 billion, a $3 billion project that took 13 years. So a serious investment. We can only dream of having that kind of contribution to, to our research in, in the conservation world. But what came out of it? Firstly, before the human genome was published, there was a lot of debate about uh, how many genes uh, humans had. And, and that ranged from 30,000 to 150,000. So, so that's a pretty big range to be kind of operating in and, and trying to understand how humans work so that we can do all of the things that we can now do that we have the genome sequence. So the, what first came out of it was that humans have about 25 to 30,000 genes, so on the lower end of the estimation. And things that are being led, in fact, by the Garvin Institute, which is just up the road from here, are things like personalised medicine. These, these are direct outcomes from the human genome work, to the point where if you are in hospital, you can have your genome sequenced. They can tailor the medicine that they're about to give you based on how, based on the variation in your own genes. So this is a, these are pretty exciting applications for genomics. Uh, in addition to that, from a scientific perspective, we can, the, there's been lots of work coming out in the last couple of months around uh, using the human genome to understand the origin of humans. So when did they come out of Africa? Uh, did they move via Asia? When did they arrive in Australia? Did they move backwards and forwards? Genomics can help us answer some of these really interesting and fundamental questions for, for how humans have moved around. And in, in addition to that, we, we use other species, like the mouse here, for example, in what we call comparative genomics, where we're able to look at what happens in a mouse and then apply it to other species. And, and some work that came out very recently in mice showed that uh, if you knock out one, one third of the mice gene, there's one third of genes in mice are essential for life. So if you have a mutation or something goes wrong in any one of those genes, it will usually die in utero, and so it's considered a lethal gene. So there's lots of things that can then be applied to humans from understanding how things work in other species, and vice versa, in fact. So I wanted to now roll on to why we would want to use genomics in conservation. And I'm going to get to the koala eventually, but uh, first I wanted to highlight a couple of great stories and great success stories around genomics in conservation. Firstly, the Tasmanian devil. Uh, Kathy, we're lucky enough to have Kathy Belov here today, who's led a lot of that research. Uh, the genome, Tasmanian devil genome has been sequenced twice again by um, competing groups, but also um, there's been some really critical research into understanding what is the population diversity of Tasmanian devils. It's actually quite low. But that's probably somewhat to do with modern humans, but somewhat to do with the fact that they've been isolated on the island. But really important work done by Cathy and others have shown they have incredibly low immune gene diversity. And this is something that requires a lot of management because they have their very well-documented transmissible cancer. So they've been faced with a novel, a novel pathogen that they haven't really been in a great position to mount an immune response against. The, I believe that the Tasmanian devil is in a much, much better position now, and I believe that we can attribute a huge amount of that to the genomics work that's been done by Cathy's group and others. And so definitely a success story for conservation. 
The middle species is one that you might not recognise so much. That's a California condor. And this is probably globally considered one of the poster children for conservation genomics. California condors were, in, were native to the United States. And in the 1980s, their population got down to about 20 individuals to, because they had been subject to heavy metal poisoning and habitat loss. This is habitat loss and land clearing is typically a major contributor to things that ends up needing intensive conservation. So the California condor, all the remaining individuals were taken into captivity into the San Diego Zoo and others in the United States. And they went into an intensive breeding program of trying to breed from the remaining, it ended up being 14 individuals that contributed to the remaining population. And, and at the time they did a lot of intensive genetic management because they were finding they had all these congenital deformities in the chicks. So they had a lot of, a lethal, a lot of lethals, a lot of, a lot of mortality in the offspring. So they intensively manage the genomics, these, these guys at, at a genetic level, to, to maximise the diversity that they had in that remaining population because they really only had 14 birds to work with. The real success story here is that they have now been reintroduced into several locations back into the United States, into the wild, which is really why we, we have all of these conservation programs. Like, uh, Featherdale, for example, do a huge amount of, uh, of repatriation of animals back to their location of, of, of origin once they have been have deemed fit to go back into the wild because that, that is effectively what we want is a restored biodiversity and a restored ecosystem. If we were, think, if we were th to think about that in terms of koalas, I, th I thought I'd first run through a couple of the questions that we have around koalas and a couple of the things that make them quite complicated and quite challenging at times. Firstly, uh, until very recently, there has been a debate, even in the scientific literature, about how many subspecies of koalas we have. And you can imagine that this has significant implications on management if things are actually being separated by subspecies when they don't in fact exist, or if they do in fact exist and things are being in inadvertently mixed, that could also be a problem. Koalas are well documented to suffer from a lot of diseases, um, chlamydia being one of their most high pro profile ones. They also have a retrovirus, so, so the scientists in the room might be interested to know this retrovirus is an endogenizing retrovirus, so it actually inserts into the genome and, and we're actually not really sure what implications, implications it has, but potentially they are quite uh, significant for koala health. Population management is really critical, so both in, in the wild, and what I'd like to highlight at this point is the blue area on this map is the current distribution of koalas, which, which is a very large distribution for, for one animal, really. Uh, so population management is, is really important, both in the wild, but also in captivity. And, and again, I'd like to acknowledge Featherdale. The, these guys have really embraced science and were one of the first um, captive management groups who wanted to understand how, how the genetic diversity of their population looked so that they could maximise uh, diversity within their captive breeding programs. Because you can't just bring in a new animal when you think that you don't have enough diversity. There are very strict regulations about who you can have in captivity. So, so we, we have Archer's DNA. We, we, um, we can give them recommendations on who he should or should not be pa paired with during the breeding season. Uh, so, so it's both an important consideration in, the cap in captive populations but also in the wild. It, what is the historical diversity of, of koalas? And as a museum, we have koalas that have been collected not long after the museum was established. So we are in a position to go and look back at the diversity in those skins and compare it to what we see in the current day. Finally, the primary threats to koalas are typically habitat loss. Uh, when it, Once a road goes through their, their population or through their habitat, they are at risk of being hit by cars. They're, they are often attacked by domestic dogs, which surprises people, but dogs actually do have an impact on wild koalas. They um, have diseases that I've mentioned earlier. And just generally, they, they tend to, they're incredibly docile animals. So when they interact with humans, they're perhaps not in the strongest position. Koalas and humans have an incredibly long history. 
and that they were most definitely first encountered by the first Australians when they arrived well over 40,000 years ago. And again, thinking back to the distribution of koalas and thinking back to how, how many different Aboriginal groups lived in that part of Australia, so many different Aboriginal groups interacted with koalas. So they have, they have their words for koala in their own language. Koalas feature in their Dreamtime stories uh, quite a lot. Um, there's a, I, I, this is a wombat rock carving here. They, there are some do documentations of koala in Aboriginal art, but I was not able to find one that would be that I could show here today. So I, I settled for a wombat. But so that so there's a long history of Aboriginal people with Australian fauna and flora. And interestingly, a lot of the story, the Dreamtime stories that, that Aboriginal groups tell about uh, koalas are around what makes them biologically significant. So there are stories around uh, the, the koala that doesn't need to drink water, which we know that they don't, the koalas that they live in trees, and also the koala that doesn't have a tail. So those of you that got a chance to see Archer will perhaps be reminded that koalas don't have tails. So, so it's really interesting that all of this traditional science, Aboriginal science actually reflects things that we acknowledge as being biologically significant about koalas. The, they were hunted by Aboriginal groups to the point where probably the koalas resided in res, reasonably dense um, hab habitat that, and quite high up in the trees. To the point where when Europeans arrived in Australia and obviously displaced a lot of those Aboriginal populations that lived particularly around this region, the, they didn't know about koalas for about 10 years after they arrived because it, it, it took, they displaced the Aboriginal population, the hunting pressure would have been slightly relieved and so suddenly koalas became more, more abundant in that area. It did not take long before Europeans to discover that koalas might be a resource they might want to exploit. And so you can see some of the, the really shocking statistics here. And those of you that have had a chance to, to, to touch Archer, you can see just how incredibly dense his fur is. And, and the, the Europeans rapidly realised that the fur might be a market that they might want to exploit. So they initiated the pelt trade in the 1870s. So by the late 1800s, and up until the early 1900s, well over four million koalas were culled for their skins. And some of, some of the historical records are really quite astonishing. The, the, they would open a hunt and hunting season for a couple of months, they would collect 500,000 skins. And they would do that every year or so. And so you know, one of those hunting seasons represents probably more than what we have as the remaining population of koalas. So a significant impact on koalas happened uh, well post-European settlement. Because they ha they're of such high conservation concern and they get a lot of attention when, when things like roads are built and, and, the, and habitat is moved for houses, etc., we decided that we, it might be worthwhile establishing a genome sequencing project because so much can be learnt through the, the understanding things at the molecular level for management. So this started off uh, in 2013 and it, it's an, uh, established as an Aussie collaboration uh, thanks to Bioplatforms and the Australian Museum Foundation and there were four partners to start with which was us at the Australian Museum, the University of New South Wales who have the sequencing facilities, the University of the Sunshine Coast who have a particular interest in understanding disease and the University of Sydney who are interested in koala immunity. In the intervening three years the consortium has grown substantially and so now we have welcomed many, many partners into this, in, into this collaboration. And, and every, there's something in this genome for everyone because there's so much information coming out of it and there are so many questions to be asked. I thought I would very briefly run through what does genome sequencing in, um, involve. It, it's, it's quite tricky. Uh, it firstly involves the sequencing, and in this particular case, we were, we were really, um, it was important to us to try and establish this capability within Australia, and, and the Ramachotti Centre did the sequencing for us, and they hadn't really been involved in a large mammalian genome until that time, so it was a really wonderful opportunity to understand how this, these kind of big projects work. So you take a sample, you chop it up into pieces, you sequence the pieces, then what happens? we put them together in the, the, the step called assembly. And this was being, this is done by Zhilang Chen, who was at the University of New South Wales at the time. And effectively what you do is you try and put all of those pieces that you now have back into a, a sensible assembly so that they reflect how they look in life as best possible, as, as what they look like in a koala cell effectively. 
the way that we then go on to testing how successful that is by annotating. And this is where we, we add in information from other species, other koala projects that we've done, and understand what each part does. And this is typically, most commonly, you would think of the genes as this aspect of it. I might add that genes are about less than 2% of the genome, but they're a real assistance in helping us test how well our assembly has gone to understand if they look sensible and if they look like what we would expect them to do in other closely related species. And this, this work was led, is led by uh, Dennis O'Mealy, who is shared between the University, University of Sydney and the University of the Sunshine Coast. And finally, the rest of us uh, in, involved in the consortium then take these information and uh, conduct our analyses and, and come to our conclusions based on all of the huge amount of work that has preceded it. So I thought I would very briefly run through a couple of the things that we've found so far. Firstly, we, in 2014, we described for the first time the, the, the most complete set of koala genes. And, and in that particular paper, there was about 15,000 genes described. And a couple of interesting things came out of it, like they, we discovered that they had an incredibly, ex a huge expansion in alpha amylase genes, which are genes that are used to metabolize starch, and also in aldehyde reductase genes. And these are known for, to have a very uh, important detoxification function. So if we think about what a koala eats, which is starchy poison, which is eucalyptus leaves, that you can see even at the genomic level that koalas are really well suited to their diet. And this is a direct, this is the, a, a genomic adaptation to, to the koala lifestyle effects effectively. In addition to that, I, I briefly mentioned the retrovirus and I won't have time to mention it anymore, but we discovered for the first time this retrovirus in a wild koala, which was used um, up the top there for this, um, the, the transcriptome sequencing, which is just the genes. And we found that the retrovirus was present and it is of concern because it has implications potentially with lymphoma. And koalas do often present with lymphoma to vet hospitals. And so there's a lot of research going around in this space at the moment. I, some really important work was done around a koala immunity. And you'll remember Cathy uh, from her work on Tasmanian devils. Her group have been significantly involved in understanding koala immune disease diversity in koala, in koala immune diversity. And so for the first time, they characterized a ra the whole suite of immune, the, of the most immune genes that had been done previously. And really importantly, what, what came out of this work was that koalas had a comparable level of diversity to other mammals that were not of conservation concern. That is in contrast with the Tasmanian devil that has notoriously low immune gene diversity. And so automatically that is something that needs to be paid attention to and conserved in future conservation programs so that we retain as mu much immune gene diversity along with other diversity as possible. Very recently, uh, Kat Morris from Cathy's group d had a paper describing some novel koala proteins in koala milk. She also described a whole range of immune genes that were found in the koala milk. And all in, very interestingly, some potential antimicrobial function of some of those proteins, which is uh, firstly, the most important thing is to understand how it's going to affect koalas. But secondly, these kind of things can potentially be very important for human health and understanding how those antimicrobials might act on things that antibiotics don't work on anymore, for example. And I thought I'd like to finish up with some of the, the work that we're doing at the museum around the population aspect of koalas. And the, getting back to these original questions of how many subspecies are there and koala populations, when we have one, how do we manage it? And, and so we've, we've done this at the, the genetic level and I'd like to acknowledge um, there's several members of the team here in the audience today, Greta, Siobhan, Kyle, uh, and, um, and, and these guys have made a really significant contribution to helping us understand these questions. So the first um, the aspect that I wanted to highlight was some work that was led by Linda Neves, who is currently looking at pandas. If, if koalas aren't cute enough, uh, she's shared between us and um, the Edinburgh Botanic Gardens. And Linda uh, led this work, which was the largest sample of koalas uh, analysed to date, looking at the distribution there. You can see the dots rep represent our samples. The grade area is the known distribution of koalas. So a reasonable coverage of the distribution. And the number one question that we were particularly keen to put to bed was how many subspecies of koalas are they? So for managed, you still see koalas managed by subspecies. 
uh, you, it might be interesting to know that um, the subspecies conveniently follow the state lines. So there's there's one there's a one that was considered to be a Queensland one, there's a New South Wales one, and there's a Victorian one. The koalas don't, as far as I know, they don't read maps. Uh, but it was really important to to understand if these were real things, because if if things are being artificially managed at the state line, this is this is perhaps creating an artificial boundary that, that within which only diversity can be shared rather than across those boundaries. So what we did was look at all look at um, samples from right across the distribution and analyze them for what are the different what we call lineages so you can see four different colors here but that doesn't mean that we have four different species not even close what it means is that we have four different clades of, of that are similar to each other but importantly they're all mixing together you can see that they're they intermingle particularly the the northern parts in New South Wales and not further north they're mingling together the the blue ones down the bottom those, those um, are ones that have actually expanded into habitat that was effectively emptied out due to the koala hunting. In, in the early 1900s, the South Australian population went extinct due to hunting. So some habitat opened up and an animals are actually translocated by humans. So humans do like to add a bit of extra complication. So they moved a bunch of Victorian animals around to South Australia. So that's that population now. It's, so getting back to the subspecies question, if I bring your attention to the picture, to the graph on the very far right, you can see two what are known as phylogeographic barriers. And these are barriers that were probably quite ancient, like tens of thousands of years ago. And we find those present in many species of mammals. And some, for some reason, they weren't able to get across it due to geographic um, difficulties or due challenges. So, so effectively, what we found was that the most diversity, the, the most differences that we could find between all of these samples, that entire distribution, were, could be explained by those two phylogeographic barriers. And, and these are, so this, is, this effectively means, once and for all, there is one species of koala, and they should be managed as such. Not that the very ones from very far north are not very different from the ones that are very, very far south. You can see a huge dif difference in size. If you were to compare Archer to a, a koala found in the southern regions, the, he would be much, much smaller because the southern koalas are much bigger. But if, in terms of management and understanding this as a species, there is just one. The other thing that was that we uh, dis discovered or, or found that was a very important conclusion was that koala, koalas, the species that we know of, has probably been around 350,000 years. They they show evidence of a huge um, continuous, a, a huge amount of con continuity within that population. So even as they, the populations have contracted and expanded through the the aridity and the glacial cycles of Australia, koalas have maintained a reasonable amount of continuity in their population. Population. And this is pretty much our key uh, finding and our key piece of advice, is no matter what you do to a koala population, ensure that they have continuity. They don't move, they're not known to move very far, but they really do need to have that option if they want to. And this work is being extended, um, led by Siobhan, who's here today, using markers that we've come, we've taken from the genome and in collaboration with people at ANU. And what we're doing now is looking at a really, really fine scale version of what I just presented to you. And, and there are some other known barriers. You can see the Hunter Valley barrier. We're wondering if whether or not that might be picked up when we use these really high resolution markers. And that's what we're, we're doing at the moment. So far, we, we haven't found anything to suggest that there are anything more than perhaps local populations that should still maintain their connectivity. And uh, importantly, I've got a photo of Anya over there from the mammal collection with some koala skins. What we're now doing is, is taking samples from those skins, which, the, which were collected just post-European settlement, to see if has there been any loss of genetic diversity. What we currently have is actually quite comparable to other species and should be maintained. But, but it is important to know if there hasn't been anything that's lost. And again, that's a really critical aspect of museums, the science and the collections that we have, that we're able to go back in time through looking at our collections. So whether it be understanding koala conservation through applying our foundational research or risk management in airports or an air, and for airlines and, and in, in the skies based on applying our, our research and our collections to um, apprehending people that might be doing strange things with wildlife. 
Hopefully, the, I've given you a very high-level overview of some of the work that we do at the museum and how it does make a difference. And if I get back to my original question, I hope that I have been compelling enough that um, you might come to the same conclusion as me, that if we were in a position to establish a museum because we didn't have one, that there is enough, that I've demonstrated that we have enough value to our stakeholders that you would do so. Because I think that museum science, it, now more than ever, we're incredibly welcoming of collaborations as well. We, we do really provide an essential pillar of research for 2016 and beyond. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. Now we've got a, a few minutes for questions. So questions. Down the back. I can't even see even though I've got my glasses on. Oh, yes. I was just wondering about the geographic changes. I mean, Paul's Gap, the numbers the numbers have gone down and yet the Otways, the numbers have gone up. And it's, is it just due to chlamydia or are there other factors that are showing changes of population in these various areas? That, thank you for that question. It's something that I didn't really um, explain incredibly comprehensively, but in some, the Otways populations, for example, and some of those southern populations, they're incredibly overabundant. But, but some of the Otways, not so much, but some of the South Australian populations have incredibly low genetic diversity because they were translocated from just a few individuals. And, and in those cases, they're actually, the koalas are starving. There, there are so many of them and, and they're so, they have so few threats that they're actually overabundant but with an incredibly low genetic base. So, so they're very challenging in the south because they're overabundant. In, it's more in the northern part of the population that they suffer from chlamydia and, and habitat clearing and, and probably the combination of all of those things can, can in, increase the level of stress and, and therefore the population sizes and, and the, the presentation of that kind of disease. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Can you talk a little bit about your future research or what you're planning to do? In general? Yes, in general. <laughs> that, thank you. That's a, that, yeah, uh, I go in, the no, short I, version, please. I, yeah. I, will, I will tell you about one really exciting piece of future research that we're about to start in collaboration with all museums and um, at, with ANU and, and all, pretty much anyone that's doing genomics in Australia. And we're looking to do marsupial genomics for marsupial and mammal genomics for all Australian species. So we're, we're looking to expand what we've done on the koala to firstly reconstruct what is the evolutionary tree for mammals in Australia. So, so that's really exciting. So we can firstly really go into detail at the genomic level. And secondly, we have every museum on board so we can, look at, we can ask that question about historical diversity for each of those species. And we also have a lot of the conservation groups on board, so um, AWC and Bush Heritage and the groups that actually have and, and the Zoo and Aquarium Association, groups that have significant number of animals under management who want to ensure that they have a genetically healthy population. So that's a project that has just launched and, and that we're part of, and it's called the OMG, the Oz Mammals Genome <laughs> Consortium. <laughs> so so that is, it's a pretty exciting and huge collaboration. Actually, on that, Rebecca, um, since Kim and you are often talking about citizen science, is there any way people here can help with some of the projects that you're doing in this area, particularly around the class. So any citizen oh, science very, aspects yes. of this? So we, citizen science is a really exciting and emerging space. It's something that we've actually been doing since the 60s. I think our, our original projects were around everyone count butterflies in, in Sydney. Um, but it is a it is a genuine way that people can contribute to our understanding of diversity and understanding of, of distribution. So if you can if you can count, log a record, and, and the, our, our colleagues at the Botanic Gardens do this really fantastically. You can log a cockatoo with the wing tags. Uh, you can log an ibis, and so you know where that individual individual species has been found. Um, I, with, we have many citizen science projects, but one that, that is intimately tied to our collection is actually assisting us digitise our collection. So we, we have about a thousand volunteers, and, and you can do it online, you can do it uh, in your lounge room at home, or you can actually come into the museum. We have about a thousand volunteers who are taking photographs of our specimen labels and of our specimens, and then putting them up online to be transcribed. Because a lot of these things, you know, some of them were 
collected by some of the most famous explorers and, his, uh, and natural historians of our time, but they're all handwritten. So it's very difficult to have text recognition convert that into something that is then available online. So we have this project where people can go in and digitise our labels and help us um, document what species those things are attached to. And then that goes up online and it's searchable by scientists that might want to use our collection pretty much anywhere in the world. It's called Digibol. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. You mentioned that uh, habitat loss is um, the, the has has been and is the major threat, and uh, it's one of them. Yeah, not not the major one, but one of, one of the major ones. Right. Um, I, I understand habitat loss is the main cause of the extinctions to date in Australia, and uh, I'm just wondering if if there is any move to uh, reintroduce koala populations into uh, national parks or reserves where where they've become extinct? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but there, there's potentially lots of things that I'm not aware of. That I think at this stage there there's a lot of attention going towards understanding the populations that we have and, and ideally you would want to manage them in situ. Uh, the, the next step would be to actually translocate them somewhere else. But hopefully we will we'll do a better job than was done in the past where that some of the South Australian populations were founded by four individuals, for example. So they have very low genetic diversity, high instance of um, ab reproductive abnormalities, that type of thing. So it, it's, it's entirely possible, but I think at the moment it's in situ management. All right. Well, I think we need to, to leave it there and say some thank yous. First of all, Archer, could you come up with Chad? <laughs> 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 and Rebecca, thank you. And thank you for all you do, not only for this great talk, but all you and your team do to help us and with lots of projects. It's very exciting and you truly are a great wildlife detective. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.